Now, on Race to Save the Planet, the story of how human beings once lived in harmony with the Earth, of how we changed and grew in numbers, of how we invented new ways to use the Earth and destroy the environment, and then of how we discovered what we'd done. The farther we look out into space, the more we realize how unique and precious is this Earth because it's the only one we know. We discovered our planet and found we were in a race to save it. It was the environmental revolution. Major funding for Race to Save the Planet is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project and public television viewers. Corporate funding is provided by Ocean Spray. Our continuing aim is to preserve and protect what we cannot create. Additional funding is provided by Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Carnegie Corporation of New York, and by the following. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Race to Save the Planet. In 10 hours of films, we're going to take you around the world to look at the state of our environment. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and we that dwell therein. This is my environment. My family and I live on this pond in Connecticut. And I always think about that scripture when one of my kids says, do we really own this pond? I mean, is this all ours? And I say to them, well, the pond and the fish that are in it and the insects that the fish eat and the plankton that the insects feed upon, all these things belong to God. And it's our responsibility and our privilege to take care of them as long as we're here. And as I'm imparting this thoughtful message of responsibility, it occurs to me that if I can't even get my kids to clean up their rooms, and I can't, how am I ever going to impress upon them the importance of cleaning up and caring for and maintaining their environment. But the truth is, it's up to us, their parents. We're the ones who are in this race to save the planet, and we have a decade to win it. If we don't, in 10 years, the natural world as we know and cherish it will have changed unalterably. And nothing that succeeding generations will do can alter that fact. In this series, however, we're going to show many different ways to work with nature, not against it. And in the first episode, we're going to look at how our ancestors related to nature, and we're going to ask the question, what changed? How did we manage to get into this mess we're in? In the Kalahari Desert in Botswana, in southern Africa, a group of hunters is making rope. They're extracting the fibers from a tough desert plant. It's likely their ancestors did the same 30,000 years ago. Outsiders call them Bushmen. This group call themselves the Shom. Their ancient way of life depends entirely on their understanding of the environment. Right now, this koho tree is producing gum, for example, and that presents an opportunity for the hunters. A ball of the sweet gum will be the perfect bait to put on the trigger of a bird trap. After many years visiting the Kalahari, Isaac Barnard and Alec Campbell have come to appreciate the vital skills needed to live off the land. Stuck the gum on the end of the stick. There. Yeah, that the gum. That, they use that little stick now as the trigger mechanism for the trap. Mm -hmm. A noose of the rope they made will complete the trap, all placed just where the bird will come looking for gum. For Alec Campbell, the trap represents perfectly the Shom's knowledge of nature. 
the skill is to know where to put it more than how to make it. I mean, you have to be completely at one with this environment to be able to live here easily. Although the show may be at one with their environment, they nevertheless exploit it extensively. Berries from the kagoom bush, for example, are used both for bait and for human food. Isaac Barnard's known this man, Rasiokwa, for 20 years. He, he say that uh, this is the bait for a Franklin's Mukweba. It's a red crescent coran and guinea fowls and all the big ground birds, you can say. The hunters have a regular routine. They set traps every day. Every day for meat. If they want meat, they go out and set traps. So one family may have three or so traps out. And almost every day they will have uh, meat. For the shom, meat comes directly from the land. And so does shelter. Rasiokwa gathers dead tree branches while his wife, Zanakati, supervises construction. The shom range over large areas, so it's common for family groups like this to build a simple structure for just a night or two's stay. It took less than 20 minutes to both gather the material and put together this particular shelter. As well as carrying their infants wherever they go, Shom women have a special responsibility. Right now it's the rainy season in the Kalahari, and the desert sands provide a cornucopia of food. It's up to the women to find it. Like the hunters, they have to know where to look and what to look for. Nuts from the marama vine are in season at the moment. They're shelled on the spot as they're gathered. The marama plant provides an excellent tuber as well. Alec Campbell made a detailed study of the wild plants these people use and counted over 150 different species, some for eating, some like this baya root, for the water they contain. At this abundant time of year, it's only an hour or two's work for a woman to gather enough for her family for the day. About 80% of their rainy season diet consists of wild plants. The rest comes from hunting and trapping, birds, antelope, and game of many kinds. This man used the same kind of trap that was set with the tree gum, only he set his around the bird's own egg. Now he can take the bird and the bait. The show make fire by rubbing two sticks together. Rasiokwa has done it so many times now, it's second nature to him. It takes less than a minute. They'll build the fire right beside the temporary shelter they put up earlier.
On the fire, the women will cook the roots and nuts gathered from the desert that morning. You see this hole on this side here. I think they're going to take some ash out of the bottom of the fire and then they will take the plants over there, those um, tubers, and they will put them in there and scrape the fire on top of them. Apart from what the men can hunt, this is their food, this is what they collect every day. And through the year it changes. I mean right now we're getting, this is, uh, that big one was a marama that they put in there and some uh, cucumbers and some marama nuts. In a month's time they'll be getting um, bohemia nuts and the marama will probably be finished. And then in a month after that it'll be brachistoma and then the month after that it'll be something else. But throughout the year they go on collecting food like this. They don't plough and they have no money to buy food, so this is their food. The Sholm's existence looks effortless, and in some seasons it is. Rainy season is the best of times in the Kalahari. But in the dry season, plant food is much less abundant. Hunting becomes more important, and that makes it harder to provide food reliably. There can be droughts here, when the supply of plants and animals drops drastically. Then times can be very bad, when the women wouldn't dream of using the roots which provide water just to wash themselves as they're doing here. The Shon people, although they use the natural world, live in close harmony with it. Their hunting and gathering way of life compels them to keep moving to look for new plants, new game. They'll be back, but not before the earth has renewed itself. For almost all of human history, perhaps a hundred thousand years, people lived this way. Then, about 12,000 years ago, there was a change. It happened in the Middle East, and here at this cave site in northern Israel, the evidence is being uncovered. Hyanim Cave is famous among archaeologists for its occupation by a particular Stone Age people. For 11 seasons, Ofer Bar Yosef excavated inside the cave. Good morning, Francois. Good morning, Ofer. Now, Francois Valla is continuing on the terrace outside. Archaeologists call the people who lived here Natufians. It seems the Natufians invented a way of life which would have profound consequences for the earth. So this means that the Natufian site expanded over this little geometric uh, about, yeah, settlement. Yeah, for sure. The Natufians took a liking to the magnificent Hyanim cave. They moved in. And then they did something nobody had ever done before. They stayed. As you can see, the Natufian people were sedentary and they invested a lot of work in bringing in all these stones from outside the cave in order to build these rounded rooms. No mobile uh, community of hunters gatherers would do the same. Staying in one place meant also burying your dead and we found in this cave over 36 burials. So it seems that the Natufians were not only the first to, to settle down, but also the first to mark their ownership of the territories and to say, this is our homeland. Why did the Natufians settle down? Archaeologists think this man and his relatives were forced into it. 12,000 years ago, the Middle East climate changed. Rainfall was reduced, so hunting and gathering became harder. The Natufians had to concentrate on their best areas, like Hyanim, where the excavators are piecing together how they lived. Stone blades and scrapers are routine finds. And the rarer discoveries are showing why Hyanim was attractive. 
there was access to many different food sources from here. Snails and reptiles from wetlands, deer and other forest animals, and plant foods cut with stone blades sent into a wild cow rib handle. Foods like this precious find of three burnt grains of wild barley. So although the Natufians were a settled people, they still depended on hunting and gathering. But that combination can never last for long. Back in Botswana, it's possible to see why. Recently, the government put in a deep well so the Shom people can have permanent water. There's a school and a health clinic going up too. The result is that the hunting and gathering Shom are now settling down nearby. They're even adopting this new permanent house style, quite different from their Bushman style shelters like this. When people settle down, a critical series of events follows. Mothers no longer have to constantly carry their children. They can be safely left with a grandmother. So the children of settled people are weaned earlier, and that means a woman can have her next child sooner. The result? Populations increase, and the wild food in the area gets used up. Large populations have to turn to agriculture because it uses so much less land. Half a square mile can support 50 people, while hunting and gathering takes 150 square miles to do the same. Right now, only a few shom are farming. Most still hunt and gather. But they're settling down as land in Botswana gets scarce and their numbers are growing. Before long, they'll all be using the new fields, carved out from virgin desert. Hunters like Rasiokwa have no option but to farm, so Isaac Barnard has decided he must help. This visit, he's brought an agricultural seed drill to use. Well, the old life of the Bushmen is gone. The old way of living is gone. Land becoming too small, too much pressure on the land, there's not enough space. They have to find some other form of uh, subsistence, and there is no other subsistence here except living off the land. And agriculture is the only alternative to hunting and gathering. That irresistible chain of events, settling down leading to more people who then must farm the land, first took place in the Middle East about 10,000 years ago. Unlike Botswana today, the transition took thousands of years. But as the Shom people are learning, the world would never be the same again. Around the same time humans switched from wild plants to agriculture, we also started raising animals instead of hunting them. Goats were first. Farming and goat herding were a man-made substitute for hunting and gathering. People had been forced into it to get around the limits of the natural environment. But soon they were to encounter dramatic new limits. The city of Amman in Jordan. In the suburbs at Ein Ghazal, this cut for a new highway was made 15 years ago. And it revealed obviously man-made white plaster floors. Buried in the hillside, there had to be an ancient settlement. It was a village from Neolithic times, 9,000 years ago. Archaeologist Gary Rolfson. What we're looking at is a Neolithic house with a beautiful plaster floor with a central hearth for heating and for cooking and for light. The plaster is of excellent quality, very sophisticated, but for these people this required a tremendous amount of fuel for the manufacture of the plaster. The Ein Ghazal people love to work in plaster. They've left some dramatic figures of themselves to prove it. But plaster is an expensive taste. 
9,000 years ago, it would have been made just like this. Limestone is first quarried out of the hillside. This particular stone starts out black in color because it contains some natural mineral oil. But it still takes a substantial load of wood to roast the stones, producing the raw plaster. The roasted limestone will then have to be ground into powder before it can be mixed with water to make the material they were so fond of 9,000 years ago. But 2,000 years later, something had gone wrong. The people of Ein Gazal first stopped using plaster, and then they abandoned their village. For Gary Rolfson, plaster floors were a perfect illustration of Ein Gazal's failure. Here we're looking at a plaster floor that was made during the last phases of occupation of Ein Gazal. Uh, it's a plaster floor in name only, because it's not really true lime plaster in the sense of the earlier periods. Instead, it appears to be a mixture of mud and perhaps pounded chalk. I suspect that this represents the lack of available fuel. In fact, in the hearths that the people were using for cooking their food, uh, wood is no longer found. The remains of wood charcoal is no longer found. Instead, they were using animal dung as the, the fuel. Over time, the Ein Gazal people used up the trees around their village. But it wasn't just trees. Other discoveries at the site all point in the same direction, of people steadily over-exploiting the natural environment around them and turning to farming. Take animal remains, for example. At first, there are many different wild species, some from woodland, like foxes, squirrels, and badgers. There are turtles, wild pigs, wild ox, gazelles, over 50 different species in all including the large bones of wild goats. But as time goes on, wild animals drop away until by the end, over 90% are domesticated types. Some cattle and pigs, but mainly the telltale small bones of the domestic goat. So the people of Ein Gazal had to become goat herders and farmers when they exhausted the forests and wild resources around them. But that wasn't enough to save them. It's 11-year-old Suleiman's job to take his Bedouin family's goats out to graze in this South Jordan Valley. As the Ein Gazal people must have discovered, goats are voracious eaters. But if there are not too many, and if Suleiman keeps them moving, the vegetation here will recover to feed the goats another day. There are also a few plowed fields scattered on the valley floor. Like their ancient ancestors at Ein Gazal, the Bedouin people here combine goat herding with farming. But in spite of the goats' appetites and the disruption of the land caused by plowing, the environment here remains stable. Gary Rolfson's wife Ilsa has studied the valley for several years and thinks she knows why things work here, but didn't at Ein Gazal. We just have a very small population in this uh, valley here, only a few hundred people, whereas at Ein Gazal we're thinking of over 2,000 people, maybe. It's a question of population size. A small population with a wide area can support itself by doing this over a certain amount of time, but if you have a large population center, it just won't work. <laughs> It was sheer numbers that killed Ein Gazal. It had grown too large, starting with land probably richer than this, and ending with this. Mankind's first experiment with settling and farming had failed. Gary Rolfson. This is the first incidence that we can attribute damage to the environment to human society. Now, it's, it's not damage that's willfully inflicted, it's simply an unwitting result of uh, going to Mother Nature's larder and taking more than they can, uh, th they can ever hope to replace. The invention of farming is called the Neolithic Revolution. It was sparked by settling down, like at Hyanim. 
and it brought rapid population growth, like at Ain Gazal. Waves of growth quickly spread. 10,000 years ago, world population was just 5 million. By the 18th century, it was 500 million. By then, most of us had become farmers. And then came the next great revolution in how we use the Earth. It was the Industrial Revolution, and it happened here in England only a little over 200 years ago. The Industrial Revolution created the modern world. It created factories, factory workers, and industrial cities. It created wealth and vast markets of consumers to buy the cars and televisions that industry produces. It created environmental pollution on an unprecedented scale. And it left no corner of the earth untouched as it reached out for greater and greater supplies of raw materials to feed its machinery. The chance event of a Middle East climate change led to the Neolithic Revolution and an extraordinary combination of events brought about the Industrial Revolution. Remarkably enough, it was again developments in agriculture that had a critical effect. An auction of breeding stock in rural England. The qualities of the animals on sale, like growth rates or fat content of meat, are well known to the buyers. The last type was bred for hive beef yields while this one's offspring will be especially good milk producers. It was a few pioneering 18th century English landowners who experimented with selective breeding as a way to improve livestock. Until then, it was thought only increased feeding could produce greater growth. The gentlemen farmers were enormously successful, doubling or tripling yields of meat, milk, and wool. There were other big changes going on at the same time, like enclosing land with fences and hedges. Enclosure changed the face of the landscape, from open fields and common land to today's patchwork of boundaries, and it changed the face of farming. An enclosed field had only one owner, so it was worth getting a better bull, or putting in drainage, or investing in a good horse and one of those newfangled machines. Here at Acton Scott Farm Museum, yet another change in English agriculture can be seen. Mechanization. Seed drills, for example, were a major innovation. Curator Robin Hill. In biblical times and until the early 18th century, the traditional way of sowing would be broadcasting, literally flinging the seed across the field. This was wasteful. Much of it was too closely gathered together and wouldn't germinate and grow properly. Weeds crept up and one couldn't tell the weed from the seed. So when people started thinking about a better way of farming, one of their first activities was to try and work out a, a more productive way of putting the seed in the ground. The seed drill we are using here is a two-row drill, which is metering out seeds at a prescribed rate. No wastage, more productivity, better yields. Still another innovation was crop rotation, which boosted soil fertility, crop yields, and yields of animal feed. More animals produced more manure, improving the land still more. Whoa. All these changes produced extraordinary growth in English agriculture. And with that growth, the country had unknowingly taken the first step into the modern world.
Every sleepy rural village was to feel the effect of the new growth in agriculture. What happened was the pace of life quickened, probably imperceptibly at first, but it led to a jump in population, and it was more people that the Industrial Revolution was going to need. In the parish church of Colleton, in the west of England, they've kept records of the lives of the villagers since 1538. Here to examine the register is population expert Alan Wrigley. The book records the baptisms, marriages, and deaths of every individual in the area. Wrigley used it to work out how England's population had grown. Just to show the kind of thing that is routinely recorded in a marriage in relation to a marriage. If we look in an early part of the register in the 1540s, a period when the handwriting is particularly handsome, we read here, John Tygon of Colleton, the younger, was wedded unto Elizabeth Hamlin, the daughter of Robert Hamlin of Colleton, on the fourth day of September. Those are the sorts of routinely recorded bits of information which you will find throughout the whole of this enormous register and others like it, out of which the life histories of individuals can be built up. Wrigley could reconstruct how many children people had, when they married, when they died, and he got volunteers to cull the same information from 4,000 other parish registers across the country. What he discovered was that population depended not on how long people lived, but on when they got married. What's novel was the discovery that mortality was not either always high or particularly variable, but that fertility was variable. That is, the number of babies that were born, the, the rate at which babies were born, varied over time. And it did so essentially because of the unusual nature of marriage in England. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Simon and Lynn Davies are now husband and wife. They and their relatives add their names to the register, as their forebears have done for 400 years. It was always thought that populations grow when people live longer, if there's more food around, for example. That was certainly the case when our Stone Age ancestors first settled down. But over time, Western Europeans evolved a marriage custom that affected birth rates instead. The custom is that couples only get married and have children if they can afford their own home. Simon and Lynn's thinking is no exception. We felt that uh, we'd got established well enough to be able to sort of um, live reasonably comfortably to, together. Getting established needs wealth, and that's just what 18th century English agriculture was creating. So more wealth, younger marriage, more childbearing years, the population boomed. But the efficient new farming methods could feed everybody without needing extra labor. And that was something new. Alan Wrigley. If you can work this trick, then you can feed a larger population, but at the same time take a larger and larger slice of that population out of agriculture and into other forms of productive activity. And it's for that reason, that's the circumstance without which you can't have rapid growth, for example, in towns and a rapid increase in the proportion of the population engaged outside agriculture in manufacture. The amazing fact is that just at that time, England was developing an urgent need for people in manufacturing. People like foundryman Bob Libet. And it's dancing, they call it. Like that, you've got a vibrated as if you've got pins and needles, like that, you see? 
Like a pneumatic amateur in today's sense. 250 years ago, the techniques Bob now demonstrates at the Iron Bridge Industrial Museum were revolutionary. This is a mold for a typical 18th century product, a section of railroad track. New technology was a vital part of the Industrial Revolution. And it was a technology based on iron and on coal. In 1709, it was discovered how to smelt iron with coke, which is partially burnt coal. Limestone has to be used as well to combine with the sulfur in the coke. Otherwise, the resulting cast iron will be weakened. Coke smelting made the iron masters into the celebrities of their age. Before this discovery, wood charcoal had been used. But England was fast running out of forests. There was a firewood crisis as severe as Ein Gazal's. Now, cast iron became the silicon computer chip of the 18th century. It was easy to work with, plentiful, and cheap. Everything was made from iron. Cooking pots, stoves, machinery of all kinds, even whole buildings. By the end of the 18th century, Colebrookdale, the area where coke smelting was invented, was becoming one of the wonders of the world. The Iron Masters decided they needed something to impress the increasing flood of visitors. So they built this, the world's first bridge, made entirely out of cast iron. It may have been the world's first example of an industrial public relations stunt. Such an elaborate structure wasn't really needed, but its fame spread far and wide. Thomas Jefferson is said to have hung one of these prints in his study. The Iron Bridge is still a tourist attraction, but the blast furnaces are gone. Such revolutionary discoveries were bound to travel. As the 19th century approached, they spread through England, then Europe, and America. Coal was not only essential for iron smelting, it was the energy source which drove the entire Industrial Revolution. You could get around the limits set by firewood by tapping into the vast stores of fossil fuel deep underground. This crew is heading deep underground. And it was only the new technology of the Industrial Revolution that made that possible. Cap House Colliery was one of the world's first deep coal mines. It's been worked for over 200 years, since the days when in pitch darkness, boys would have been stationed by the wooden ventilation doors, waiting to open them up as their mothers dragged through loads of coal. <laughs> Times have changed. Now it's even possible to walk upright for some of the way. 300 feet underground, the crew heads into one of the original workings, where you can get an idea of what 18th century coal mining was like. It's dark, it's cramped, and above all, it's wet. But deep mining gave access to miles of coal seams. Today, they'll be clearing out the old Flockton seam, the first work here. The plan is to build a gallery so the public can view this piece of industrial history. By 1800, England was producing 10 million tons of coal a year more than the rest of the world put together. It's said that coal was the first raw material to be measured in millions of tons. 
And it was all on the backs of the new industrial labor force. Mine manager, Erwin Bottomley. 200 years ago, uh, women and, and young boys would have been at work down here. They'd have been boys as young as six years old. Uh, women would have been carrying coal and men would be normally hewing the coal. Um, it would be into baskets and dragged along to the shaft and up the shaft. They would have found it very difficult. It would have been rather wet. Uh, pumping would have been in its infancy, to say the least. They would have found a lot of wet conditions. Pumping was in its infancy, but it worked well enough to keep the mines from flooding. Without it, deep mining would have been impossible. And pumping could only be done by the great workhorse of the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine. Steam, iron, coal, and the new agriculture. Together they made the Industrial Revolution. Coal fired the steam boilers. These are installed at a 19th century textile mill in the north of England. Coal was also needed to smelt the iron to make the steam engine. And the steam engine was needed to pump out the mine that produced the coal. A steam engine was first used to pump a mine in 1712. And by 1800, there were 1,000 engines installed, three quarters of them in the mines. By then, the Industrial Revolution was moving into top gear. When this engine was built in 1890, they powered pumps, factories, and mills everywhere. Mill engineer here, Arthur Martin. The millwrights that actually looked after this particular engine used to look after 250 other engines as well. And that was only one firm. So in the general area, there was a heck of a lot of engines. This one engine used to run 1,000 looms. There are now about 20 left working in the cotton weaving shed, maintained as a factory museum. The Industrial Revolution was as profound a change as the Neolithic Revolution. First, nomads had become farmers. Now farmers were becoming factory workers. This new way of life brought the world many things. Industrial diseases, the drudgery of factory work, but above all, growth. Growth in wealth and in population, which nearly doubled in the 19th century, crowding into huge new industrial cities. This new urban and industrial world was a powerful threat to the natural world. Up on the moors that lie between the industrial cities of Sheffield and Manchester, you can see some of the first results. John Lee is a biologist from Manchester University who's been studying the peat bogs. By his estimate, they've been growing up here for as long as 7,000 years until the world's first acid rain began to fall. Well, this is a peat deposit with the peat forming at the surface and peat is naturally a fairly light color. This dark band represents soot deposited in the peat at the time of the Industrial Revolution and in the period immediately following. Acid from coal smoke killed the bogs. Now, with their cover of growing moss gone, they are gradually eroding away, back to the bedrock. It was the first large-scale industrial pollution, coming from the disastrous new cities. The conditions in the new industrial towns were really quite awful. There was no real sewage system. There was all this uh, coal smoke produced as a result of, of steam, the need for steam power. And the end result was uh, a most unhealthy uh, kind of existence for the people. The average age of death for the working people in Manchester was 17 years in 1840. And this compares with something like 34 years in the rural areas surrounding. 
In time, the world learned to live in the new cities, with pipe water, sewage treatment, mass immunization programs against disease. The industrial way of life was embraced in Europe and America, and the explosive growth that went with it. The industrial world had a voracious appetite. While America exploited its vast continent, Europeans turned to their empires. By 1850, England was importing 600 million pounds of raw cotton a year. Timber came in from the world's tropical forests. Raw latex from Far East rubber plantations. Agricultural products of all kinds for prosperous workers who could afford exotic luxury goods as well. But many of the materials were not to stay long. They were shipped out as manufactured goods, some back to the colonies. Cars, bicycles, pots and pans, machinery, cotton cloth. There was now no part of the planet which was not affected by the Industrial Revolution. After the Industrial Revolution, the pace of change accelerated, and there were new kinds of pollution with global impact. Up, up, seven miles into the sky, the awe-inspiring cloud billows and surges, blotting out the... Atom bomb tests brought home just how extensively we were interfering with nature. Reports of radioactive contamination began to come in from around the world. In fish, on pastures, in milk, even in children's bones. And then there were the new wonder chemicals insecticides like DDT. In the 50s, it was used heavily on forests and cropland. DDT was great for keeping the mosquitoes at bay, too. Hardly anybody could do without it. But soon it became clear that something was wrong. In her famous book, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson warned that contaminants could build up in living things and destroy them. We were undermining our environment. Soon after Silent Spring, the death of Lake Erie was proclaimed. Untreated sewage and industrial waste had overwhelmed some parts of the lake, killing much of the life. The environmental impact of the industrial way of life was becoming blindingly apparent, sometimes literally. Many of the most severe effects were being felt in the United States, now the world's leading industrial economy. With millions of cars and belching smokestacks, America's cities were choked with smog. Even beautiful California was not immune. In 1969, the nation watched as a ruptured oil well in the Santa Barbara Channel spewed out millions of gallons of crude oil. Yet, just as the environment was becoming a nationwide concern, Americans were discovering a new way of looking at the world. On their way to the moon, they found the Earth. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. They picked a good day for it. Dennis Hayes, a student then, recalls the attitudes of the time. There was a lot of rhetoric about how you you can't grow forever on a, on a round planet because sooner or later you're going to run into yourself. But that, that came home in, in its most sort of poignant and, and effective fashion when we actually saw this small blue planet from the vantage point of space, began to recognize our finiteness and, and ultimately our own vulnerability. But this really was something that we as a species could adversely affect in a way that could in fact bring about planetary death. Dennis Hayes helped organize Earth Day 1970, a teach-in first suggested by a U.S. senator, which became a surprise nationwide success. Everybody did their thing. Students demonstrated and professors lectured. Paul Ehrlich warned of the population bomb. 
changing addresses and so on, there still are some people in this country that don't realize that population control is the ticket that will give us a chance to solve all the rest of the problems of humanity. That is... Earth Day appealed to everyone. That concern for the environment should inspire such broad and enthusiastic support was something new. At first, it was a reaction against the despoiling of America's natural environment. But the concern was soon taken up around the world. The movement became international. The first World Environment Conference was held in Stockholm in 1972. Soon, though, a clash developed. Indira Gandhi, India's Prime Minister, cordially greeted Morris Strong, the conference organizer. But she was here to point out that the industrial countries had created the problem. Countries with but a small fraction of the world's population consume the bulk of the world's production of minerals, fossil fuels, and so on. Thus, we see that when it comes to the depletion of natural resources and environmental pollution, the increase of one inhabitant in an affluent country at his level of living is equivalent to an increase of many Asians, Africans or Latin Americans at their current material levels of living. That one Disagreement between rich and poor remains to this day a major obstacle to global cooperation on the environment. But Stockholm did have a lasting effect. Morris Strong. By the time the Stockholm conference ended, I think both industrial, both the wealthy countries and the poor countries agreed that this was a global issue. This was an issue for everybody, that the theme of the conference, Only One Earth, was in fact a good description of reality. The environment issue, as a result of Stockholm, truly became a global issue, an issue for everyone. An issue for everyone. The environmental revolution had arrived. A revolution as powerful as the one which had transformed our hunting-gathering ancestors, who lived so lightly on the earth, into settled farmers, who used the earth more heavily, who began to find environmental limits, and whose numbers grew and grew until the Industrial Revolution. More growth, more people. The earth used more heavily still. The environmental revolution has made us understand where we humans are taking the earth. Towards a world poisoned by pollution. Towards an atmosphere disrupted by greenhouse warming and losing its protective layer of ozone. Towards rivers, oceans and beaches made unusable by sewage and toxic waste. towards unmanageable piles of garbage filled with the squandered resources of the planet. Towards a population of 10 billion in 60 years. Twice as many as today. With the prospect of feeding those billions from farmland eroded to the breaking point. It'll be a world in which wild things have no room to live. A world in which forests have disappeared. Only the environmental revolution can save the planet from this fate. This little speck of dust is a nothing in the cosmos. And yet, the farther we look out into space, the more we realize how unique and precious is this Earth because it's the only one we know. And just think, the whole of human life is now in our hands, literally in the hands of our generation. Because what we do or fail to do now is going to determine the degree to which human life and human civilization is in fact going to survive. 
on our planet. That's an awesome responsibility, and to have any part in dealing with that responsibility sure is, surely is the most important thing that anybody could do at this stage. That vision at the end of the film of an environmentally devastated world is not science fiction, but it's also not inevitable. As Mars Strong says, the future of human life, of human civilization, is now in the hands of our generation. What we do, or fail to do now, really matters. Please join me next time for Race to Save the Planet. Major funding for Race to Save the Planet is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project and public television viewers. Corporate funding is provided by Ocean Spray. Our continuing aim is to preserve and protect what we cannot create. Additional funding is provided by Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Carnegie Corporation of New York, and by the following. For more information on the college telecourse, video cassettes, off-air videotaping, and books based on the series, call 1-800-LEARNER. This is PBS. Next on Race to Save the Planet, the biggest threat to the world's environment, climate change. Already, man-made gases are destroying the ozone layer. Now, more gases may bring greenhouse warming with devastating results. Watch Only One Atmosphere, next time on Race to Save the Planet.